Alice Sondlin and Herbert Konings are founding partners of Security Token Group. All opinions expressed by them or guests on this podcast are solely their opinions and do not represent the views of Security Token Group or its subsidiaries. You should not take any opinion expressed on the show as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow any investment strategy. This podcast is for informational purposes only. Welcome, everyone, to the Security Token Show. Thanks for tuning in. I'm your host, Harry Konings, and with me, as always, of course, is my co-host, Kyle Sondland. And we've got a packed episode for you today, starting with last week's industry news, the latest STO and secondary market updates, and also a deep dive into our main topic today, which is regarding the Howey test, the rule that defines securities in the United States. It's another exciting episode, Herwig. I cannot wait. But before we get into all that, we have to start off the show as always by spotlighting two different firms making the biggest moves last week with our Company of the Week awards. Who do you have this week as your Company of the Week for episode 62, Herwig? Well, I'm glad you asked, Kyle. I want to put everyone's attention actually towards a company out of London called Digital Debt Capital Markets. Uh, It's announced actually over 4.3 million pounds in financing last week. That's a well over five and a half million US dollars, so no small amount. And continues with a trend in September of security token capital companies raising money, like Dusk out of the Netherlands uh, recently. And Digital Debt Capital Markets has the Agora platform, which is meant to be a completely digital end-to-end platform for managing pre and post trade functions in fixed income markets, all powered by distributed ledger technology, of course. So their website says they have a vision to, quote, utilize markets leading distributed ledger technology to pave the way for digital securities that comply with existing regulations, enhance information sharing, and eliminate costly reconciliations while maintaining privacy. And well, Kyle, that is a vision that I can get on board with. So welcome to the space and with a fresh keg of capital powder to go with it, they are ready to try and make that vision happen. So for that, folks, I give Digital Debt Capital Markets my company of the week. You just love to see it. Congratulations, Digital Debt Capital Markets. Having that fresh powder, having capital to be able to hit this market hard and really be able to advance the developments that they want to do and reach their goals is fantastic. Amazing work from everyone there. I look forward to seeing. I love this space, Kyle. I think they're doing great work and I'm sure you've got someone doing cool stuff too. What do you got? Ladies and gentlemen, we have more big news this week. And I'm kicking it off with HG Exchange, a Singapore-based private securities exchange that is officially live after graduating from the Monetary Authority of Singapore's Sandbox in June. So the firm actually plans to service the listing and trading of both digital and non-digital capital market products. So the exchange has three founding issuers, Philip Capital, Prime Partners, and Fundnell, and they're all trading on the exchange live. It's not clear which ones are tokenized yet, but they're definitely focused on digital offerings and clearly have an eye on iStocks for that number one spot in Singapore. The firm also has an incredibly strong management team and also announced that Richard Tang, who is formerly an executive at the Monetary Authority of Singapore and a chief regulatory officer of the Singapore Exchange, has now been appointed chairman of HGX. The firm claims it has a database of 500,000 investors and seemingly will immediately enter the space as a liquidity leader in the private sector. As with iStocks, the transactions themselves may be restricted to registered investors on the platform, but we're going to work hard to get as much information and data on these offerings moving forward as possible. So congratulations to another successful launch of an exchange, this time again in Singapore, as we near 10 live security token exchanges and marketplaces all around the world. Got to expect more by the end of the year and dozens by the next 12 months, but this is just leading the way. Amazing work from HGX. Congrats from graduating and congrats for going live. Wow, that's amazing. Half a million investors. Singapore continuing to be a hotbed of activity for the space. Really great choice for Company of the Week winner there, Kyle. And congratulations to HGX. Looks like you are the new kid on the block looking to make big waves. Now let's get on to the news section. And before we do, of course, I do want to let all our listeners know, especially the new ones, that everything we talk about on the show, all the articles, they're sourced from stomarket.com slash news. And they're also available for your reference at any time, either in the about description on the pa- on the podcast, wherever you're listening to, or on the Security Token Show Medium blog as well, uh, where you can really dig into these articles themselves and learn more. 
So with that, let's start off the news this week with a focus on the world's 17th largest bank. That's Societe Generale's one and a half trillion in assets under management that also happens to be a trailblazer in the security token space, having previously won my company of the week in episode 45 for issuing a multi-million dollar housing finance obligations bond that was actually tokenized on Ethereum, rated AAA, and it was settled actually using an e-euro stable coin powered by the Central Bank of France, no less. So that's very impressive stuff. And now a Coindesk article has revealed that the French bank is planning to to trial as many as five different blockchains for the capital markets R&D pilots they're working on. It's not clear which other blockchains the bank is considering other than one, which is Tezos, and they're looking at a, a CBDC, a central bank digital currency application there. But beyond Tezos and Ethereum, it was not disclosed which other blockchains would be considered. I mean, could Stellar or Algorand be next? Maybe Polywath, uh, you know, we own. Uh, we hope to find out for sure and let you know. Huge news there. Wow. And next up, we saw an announcement from the embassies of Kazakhstan and Japan announcing a slew of deals worthy combined around $46 million, actually. So that this included bringing a lot of blockchain in a variety of different applications. And one of those, of course, included using Japanese cryptocurrency experts to help set up a cryptocurrency stock exchange powered by security token offerings, which for that, I can really only assume and read as, you know, launching a security token exchange. So very interesting to see Japan's security token prowess and expertise be used in a foreign country in this sort of interesting partnership uh, between them all. So very cool. And moving back over to the U.S., we saw some major news from the SEC and the OCC, which each issued clarifications for the regulatory stance on stable coins in the U.S. And I've got the breakdown for you thanks to Coindesk's Nick Hilesh D., so the OCC has basically green-lighted reserve banks working with stablecoin issuers to back their reserve accounts under hosted wallets. So this is great news as stablecoin issuers like Coinbase's USDC is seeing massive adoption as they will now be able to further provide safety and security for their end users thanks to the new accompanying letter the OCC published regarding stablecoin issuers and reserve banks. So meanwhile, the SEC has agreed with this but warned that some stablecoins could still be treated as securities and urged issuers to reach out to the SEC to be evaluated for a no action letter, which essentially clears you from the SEC that you'll receive receive no action against you from them. So basically, no real changes to the existing infrastructure here. Just a reminder that the regulators are open-minded to the technology as long as you play by the current rules. And we also saw a major announcement in the U.S. from cryptocurrency exchange Kraken, which claims to be the first U.S. licensed digital asset bank after receiving a financial bank charter in the U.S. known as a special purpose depository institution, which enables Kraken to offer deposit taking, custody, and fiduciary services. The company is rumored to get involved in security tokens in the past, but as most of you listening know, in order to do that, you need a broker dealer with an ATS license, which Kraken doesn't have, but was supposedly considering registering with FINRA for as early as May 2018. So the fact that we haven't seen anything and now that they have a bank charter tells me though that they're probably not going to be jumping into security tokens anytime soon. And moving into company announcements, we're starting off with two-time Company of the Week winner Figure, which is a home equity line of credit lender that uses the blockchain to originate loans completely on-chain. The firm actually recently announced Digital Fund Services. That's right. They are moving beyond loans and into fund management, now claiming that the Providence blockchain can be used to automate largely manual paper-based processes associated with fundraising, investment fund setup, and ongoing fund management. That is obviously major news because Figure has been doing very well proving the value of the Providence blockchain that they built in the debt space, having issued over a billion dollars in HELOCs and having securities, actually even securitized, over half a billion dollars of it, including the largest securitization of HELOC loans since the 08 crisis. So they're doing big moves there. And the only reasons this honestly didn't win my company of the week is that they launched with a rather unknown family office partner. So hopefully we can expect some top tier funds to start considering this platform as well, which means we might even see a marketplace for limited partnerships powered by Providence very soon. So great stuff as always, figure team, keep it up. 
And we also saw a partnership and investment between crowdfunding portal Bank to the Future and KYC provider BlockPass. So the portal announced an undisclosed investment into the company and said they would be integrating their services for KYC and for users on their platform. So investing in in your infrastructure, you know, seems pretty smart, pretty logical to me. Strategic um, investment there, indeed. <laughs> And we also saw a partnership announcement between LCX, the Liechtenstein-based cryptocurrency and security token exchange, and Regula Forensics, which is a compliance and anti-fraud firm. So this partnership is designed to improve the customer experience of the exchange while ensuring top-notch compliance and safety measures. And the final partnership announcement came from Archax and Flovtech, which is out of uh, Switzerland, I believe. So Archax, which recently became the first ever FCA-approved security token exchange in the UK, of course, has partnered with Flovtech, uh, allowing uh, liquidity solutions for digital assets. So the partnership is, of course, geared towards being able to provide enhanced liquidity for security tokens listed on the Archax platform. So in my opinion, it seems like maybe Archax is getting ready to list some big announcements, Kyle. That's Flovtech, F-L-O-V. Tech, T-E-C-H, Flav Tech, one word. And over in the U.S., most popular security token exchange, T0, has announced a new board of directors member, John Jacobs. So John is actually a former NASDAQ CMO and an executive vice president at the company. So it sounds like John will be bringing a lot of capital markets experience and marketing experience to T0. And the final company announcement I have for you is from the Libra Association, announcing its newest member, Blockchain Capital. So Dante Desparte, who's the head of policy and communications for the Libra Association, said, quote, as a member of the Libra Association, Blockchain Capital brings deep industry insight and a dynamic network of supporters as we work on building a blockchain-based payment system that supports responsible financial services innovation. It's not clear how else BCAP, that's the name of the token representing limited partnership interest in Blockchain Capital's fund, is going to be involved at this time other than what they just said in that quote. You know, but it seems to be part of a continuing trend for Libra to rebrand itself in a more positive light for a bid with regulators by bringing on new members. And moving into our resources and opinion section, I have an article from Fintech News Switzerland, which covers the difference between security tokens and natively digital securities. So last week on the show, I specifically mentioned that Switzerland passed a law now allowing you to host your securities on a blockchain-based registry. This allows for natively digital securities. Security tokens, on the other hand, are most typically just digital representations of securities that are already tracked on a non-blockchain based registry. So the article covers some great recent growth in the market as well, including by the way, a nice citation to the security token market data. So thanks for that FinTech News Switzerland. And lastly, I have a digital asset report interview with Stéphane DeBates, who's the CEO of Elevated Returns. That's the issuer behind the St. Regis Aspen. So Vince Molinari, who was previously the CEO of Templum, conducts the interview on behalf of his new media firm. So check it out when you get a chance, especially if you're looking at the St. Regis token itself. And that is all that I have for you this week, folks. Kyle, can you tell us about the latest upcoming industry events, please? Absolutely. There's only one event coming up, uh, only one that we have for this week, Herwig, and it's from the Austrian Private Equity and Venture Capital Association, or AVCO, who is hosting their third roundtable discussion focused on private equity and venture capital industries. So the specific topic of the discussion this week, or I think it's September 30th, is, quote, is tokenization a game changer for financing startups and small to medium enterprises? And so it features industry leaders like Valerie Halter of Curio Invest, who are tokenizing the expensive cars and many of the other luxury goods, as well as Christoph Kannenberger of Apex Ventures, Bernard Blaha of Cryptix AG, and many more. So they go on live, as I said, September 30th at 11 a.m. EST. So the tickets are free on Eventbrite. You may as well go check this one out. It's going to be a a nice panel and it's interesting to see the perspectives of those all around the world sounds like another great event and kyle i think that's time for our segue into some sto news what do you got for all of us we got some serious news this week first off we're going to go with an sto update and that's from inx which as you may remember is the highly touted blockchain ipo for a security token exchange and so inx announced that there's more than 500 investors who have registered for the offering to date with roughly 210 of them putting money in 
And so I actually take that back. They didn't announce it, but they can't publicly disclose it. However, we were able to track down through multiple articles and through researching through Etherscan, actually the wallets that get registered for this offering. This is all public information through the public ledger. And so according to Etherscan, we can see all of the registered wallet addresses, which means that they went through the, the registration process, gave their KYC and all that good stuff. But we can also see which addresses received tokens, the INX tokens in exchange, which would signify that they put in an investment. So we can't see the exact cash amounts or any information about the size of each holding. But as we reported last week, INX has raised seven and a half million from a private company called A-Labs. So we know that they've raised at least that. And then with a thousand dollar minimum investment in the offering by any retail investor, we can do the math and say the firm has raised at least eight million or so. But the number is likely closer to 10 or more based off of the fact that that's just the minimums. So congratulations, INX. Seems like they have started out strong. Their minimum investment, you know, I think was around that seven and a half million range. So now they're, they're onboarding more investors and they're trying to go for 117. So we'll see if they can get all the way up there, but we can say for sure that they are successful in raising capital. Just so cool to see how blockchain changes this entire experience and, and how we can track this now information, which is usually usually impossible to learn, mm -hmm. right? So shout out to TokenSoft, who I believe is a provider behind all this. Uh, and, and congrats, INX, on the success so far. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Like you can't, you literally aren't allowed to disclose the, the public status of the fundraise. But again, because of Etherscan, we're able to do some of the, the connecting of those dots. Moving into some security token offerings, the first one we have here is from the China Real Estate International Building, which is a high-rise skyscraper being built in the capital of Cambodia. I'm honestly not going to try to pronounce the, the, the city name, but it is going to be tokenized. And so in collaboration with Titan Capital, who's the broker behind the, the scenes here, they're now soliciting qualified investors worldwide. It seems like U.S. may be allowed in this as well. The ABT security tokens can be exchanged for the ownership of the property, but According to the article, they also may be used to offset rents and other various types of consumption that were not directly specified in the article. So potentially this is kind of a redeemable or convertible token into many different types of, of values or assets. The building is planned to be the largest in Cambodia, and the China Real Estate International Building has officially launched a global roadshow. According to the release, they will soon carry out online and offline events in the Southeast Asian countries, and at that time, we should have more details on the terms of the deal and the plans for the offering. But either way, pretty cool. They're financing a, a building in the growing business district of Cambodia through a security token offering. They're focusing on South. Uh, Southeast Asia investors. This is all fantastic news. We love to see it. And Vertalo is back in the news, this time with another partnership as the firm is working with REI Capital Growth to launch two real estate investment offerings. The first one is a $50 million equity offering backed by stabilized cash flowing commercial real estate. And the second one is a $50 million debt offering aiming to replace traditional mortgage debt for its real estate fund by borrowing money directly from global investors. According to the article on Crowdfund Insider, the firm plans to only conduct Reg S exemptions for these offerings, meaning that they will be open to international investors but will exclude U.S.-based investment. I'm honestly not exactly sure why, considering both firms are U.S.-based and REI invests in U.S. commercial real estate, but either way, they have ambitious plans and this is another great client for the newly launched Vertalo real estate platform. Finally, we have Ignium, which is an issuance platform based out of Estonia, who announced their first security token offering on their platform. Tangible KK is a Japan-based bond securities firm, and it's seeking to fund the development of what they call Basecamp, which is a seven-unit boutique ski resort in Niseko, Japan. Ignium is licensed through the Capital Markets Authority of Montenegro and will open the offering to both European and US investors. The tokens are selling for 50 euros a pop on the Coin Metro platform, which we did cover in episode 58. The firm just launched a security token exchange in partnership with Ignium and the CMA in Montenegro. Kevin Murko, who's the, the founder and chief executive of Coin Metro, added in the press release, quote, we look forward to many more interesting projects both on the primary side and on our very own secondary market infrastructure, end quote. This is pretty big news. I mean, watch this scene. This is now a second security token exchange we can confirm has offerings that is live. And congratulations to Ignium for, for being the issuance platform behind this deal. Tangible KK for jumping on board, getting on board with security token offering. And I can't wait to see more tokens and an active secondary market here based out of Montenegro very soon.
Absolutely love this deal, Kyle. Yet another real estate offer, and folks, this seems to be the, the continuing trend, but another key word there, 50 euros minimum. That's incredible what blockchain and fractionalization is doing or create global access now to, as you said, real estate in Montenegro. So super, super cool deal. Absolutely tremendous. So excited to see that one. We also have a market update from another real estate property. This one Herwig mentioned earlier, but our first market update comes from Aspen Coin, which is the most recent asset listed on T0, which represents fractional ownership of about 19% of the St. Regis Aspen Resort, which is that five-star hotel in Colorado. And last week they announced a loyalty program for the ASPD shareholders. So according to a document published by the president of Elevated Returns, Stephane DeBates, who Herwig mentioned mentioned earlier, that's the management company behind the Aspen Resort. Apparently, the holders of the ASPD security token are now eligible for a cash rebate on stays at their hotel. So according to the breakdown that was published, you, if you own as little as 10,000 shares, which is around $13,000 in current prices, you're actually eligible for a 20% discount on any stay at the St. Regis Aspen Resort. Holders of 100,000 or more tokens will be discounted 35%. And finally, if you own more than 500,000 ASPD tokens, you can actually stay at the hotel, any of their different suites for half price. Rooms at the St. Regis range from 500 to 1500 bucks a night. This is actually some serious savings if you're planning a trip or multiple trips. Um, so it's a nice little perk if you're a shareholder. Like I really like the type of innovative thinking here to build engagement with your investment community. And I like this model for an investor relations strategy for uh, issuers that are listening. You know, Kyle, and maybe some of our loyal listeners know that I'm a huge fan of this concept. I consider it a very advanced use case of security tokens since we're already just trying to establish the early proponent, but whatever gets people going and using it, right? So as you mentioned earlier uh, with the Cambodian deal that mm -hmm. there might be doing lots of offsetting rent, I love that this is becoming more and more a use case. So great, uh, you know, innovating there, uh, Stefan and, and St. Regis, really cool stuff. Yeah, right, especially when we're talking about bringing down minimums, it's kind of like we really are combining the investor with the consumer. And so the, the more ways that you can get the investors tied to your product, the, the more effective your business is going to be, the healthier that investment strategy is going to be. And presumably, the stronger the, uh, the liquidity will be for that system. Totally. So moving into the other market updates, we had one more to wrap it up. We have another article written by Omar Faridi of Crowdfund Insider covering Jonas Shulman's coverage of the security token market performance in August. So thank you so much for, for the coverage, Omar. Great work as always, Jonah. This guy is a beast. And then moving into the security token trading data, we're talking about the secondary market. As always, the, we've got news on stlmarket.com slash news, but we also have all of those live updating prices. You know that that's programmatically updated. And we're talking about the market cap, stlmarket.com. So we're talking about STL market cap. We're down 5% this week, unfortunately, from 550 million to about 525. Overstock and T0 did have a small dip this week, which as you could probably predict is the reason why we're down a little bit, but they do still hold strong daily trading volumes. So it does seem like it's still healthy and that there's still investor interest. We're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars for T0. Overstock I think was around 90,000 on Monday. Other than that, real estate had an up and down week as well. Some of the tokens were up a few percent, others were down a few percent. So honestly, it was a pretty quiet week for the industry, which honestly isn't all that bad. Volatility can be great when you're in the black, but it also demonstrates signs of less than ideal liquidity or a lack of consistent investor conf confidence, especially when things are down. So good figures for us to compare with next week's data for sure. Absolutely. And I just want to give a quick shout out there. You know, Jonah has been doing these great reports and insights on the, the market. And there's obviously some great covers there from Omar. So definitely want to give a big shout out there. And the market does still look good despite this week's, you know, slight fall, I think, Kyle. Nothing major or alarming. But with that, I think we can go right into our main topic for today, which is all about the Howey tests and also something you might have heard of called uni. So I think we, you know, for those of you who do not know, you know what the Howey test is, it's the rule of precedent that the SEC uses to evaluate whether something is actually considered a security or not here in the United States. You're absolutely right, Herwig. This was the biggest issue for ICOs and cryptocurrencies. The main question was that, are they financial instruments that the SEC needs to regulate or not? And the Howey test is what we used over and over again by both issuers and regulators alike to try to prove their point. And that's exactly the issue because it's just not a perfect system and it was not optimized for blockchain and cryptocurrency. There is room for gray area. 
In fact, that gray area is surfacing once again with DeFi. Our main topic actually is chosen today because of the recent release of the Uniswap utility token with the ticker UNI. Yeah, there were already rumblings, you know, that came out about whether some other tokens were considered securities or not in the DeFi space, but this latest one really has people talking. So maybe Kyle, could you give us an overview of what's happening with Uniswap? Some of our listeners might not actually know. So if you've been listening to the podcast, you may recognize Uniswap. And Uniswap is a decentralized exchange providing liquidity for any Ethereum-based token. The exchange launched a tech stack that allows for seamless swapping of tokens by leveraging smart contracts. This process is known as an atomic swap, which we covered in much more detail in episode 41. They've also added functionality to allow for whitelisting of wallet addresses, which is crucial for the transfer of security tokens on their platform. With a whitelist, they require that a wallet address be approved by the issuer before the address is able to trade that token. In this way, an issuer can ensure that the proper KYC or accreditation standards are met before Uniswap provides the liquidity. Uniswap earns the title of a decentralized exchange because there is no centralized team that is actually running the exchange, powering the liquidity, or approving listed tokens. Any ERC-20 token issued anywhere can be listed and exchanged on the platform, and the liquidity of each trading pair is powered by the users who stake tokens in exchange for fees on each transaction, while the Uniswap Foundation, who built the whole thing, also does take a little cut. Because of the transparent, open source nature of the Unicorn protocol and the Uniswap exchange, coupled with the ability to list any Ethereum token, this platform became the de facto standard for liquidity in the DeFi space, with Uniswap volumes actually surpassing Coinbase in daily trading volume in August, which it still maintains as of recording this episode. This is no small feat, and Uniswap is no small company. So Uniswap has been the main topic in the entire crypto community this week because they recently airdropped a token to all investors, founders, and users of the platform. I also own some, by the way. Using September 1st as a cutoff date, the firm literally airdropped 400 tokens, uni tokens, by the way, to anyone who's ever used the platform before. That means if you've made a swap or even failed the transaction but attempted to use the Uniswap platform prior to September 1st, you are entitled to a free 400 uni. There's literally no strings attached. You just have to pay gas, which right now is maybe 10 bucks on Ethereum. These uni tokens allow for the ability to govern the decentralized protocol and vote on decisions made by the company. Unlike many other governance tokens, this one actually has users and a developed product. So the governance actually has consequences here about what their decisions are around fees and around different listing processes and liquidity um, in terms of their automated market making. So this, this does have consequences. This is real value. After the airdrop, the tokens were immediately listed on Uniswap Exchange because they're on Ethereum. And they're currently trading for around $4, but hit a high this weekend of over 8 bucks. That means that anyone even tangentially familiar with the platform likely earned a quick few thousand dollars in real US dollars last week. I'll note that if you haven't claimed yet and you feel that you might be eligible because you had some experience with the platform, just log on to app.uniswap.org, connect your MetaMask wallet, and you should immediately see a big pop-up allowing you to claim your tokens. Since the launch of the token, we saw a ton of lawyers as well as non-lawyers jump out to claim that the Uni token is a security. While we've seen buzz before about other governance tokens potentially falling in this same category, I certainly haven't seen the reception this strong in the negative direction about a token like this before. So with all that out of the way, I think we have enough background on Uniswap to dig into the regulatory pieces in play here, Herwig. Thank you, Kyle. It was a very thorough rundown and I think sets the stage of why this is kind of such a big deal. So let's dig into why critics are calling it a security using the Howey test. But of course, before we do that, we need to go over the Howey test itself, of course. So first, I'll start with a little backdrop from where this ruling even came from. Now, that there was actually an SEC versus WJ Howey Co. case. So let's change gears to that and go back all the way to 1946. So the Second World War had just ended and good old William John Howey wanted to sell some land with citrus groves on it. Now, William John was violating securities laws because he was advertising his investment opportunity to non-accredited investors, which violates general solicitation laws set forth by the Securities Act of 1933, which wouldn't get amended to allow for general solicitation, of course, until 2013. But the problem in the case was whether or not what William John was selling was considered a security or not. 
And not to get too much into the weeds, but William John Howie was trying to be clever and also offer a management company that will service the land and the citrus groves exclusively and will not allow any other vendors to do so. So it's a little bit of tricky and sly stuff that probably the SEC doesn't like. Needless to say, the case ultimately determined a set of criteria that must be fulfilled in order for a financial instrument to be considered a security regulated under the Securities Act of 1933. Right. So that's where the term the Howey test comes from. Obviously, William John got nailed with being a security. So what criteria did they come up with? So there are primarily four criteria and all criteria must be met. The first is an easy one. There must be a counterparty making an investment or, you know, contributing money and resources. The second is that there is an expectation of profits or returns from making that contribution from the counterparty. And it's also expected that there is a common enterprise, a third, you know, that's used to create these returns. You know, you know, this removes any issues of direct loans and things like that. You have a common enterprise that's, that's, providing all of this. And of course, that means that there are active efforts of others making sure that this happens. So in the case of Howie, he had investors that put in money and expected money back out while a common enterprise was the land and citrus groves business, while the work came from the management company that serviced the land that John William Howie operated. So the four prongs were met and these four prongs now determine what is considered a security in the United States. Although also keep in mind, folks, we are not attorneys. We may sound like it. So that's a good explanation, I think. So if we circle back to Uniswap, let's take the view from the critics and say that it is a security using the Howey test. I think obviously Uniswap, the company and the protocol is considered the common enterprise here. The work from others could be considered the employees or for-profit corporation of Uniswap, which itself has raised 11 million from outside investors. Then there's this expectation of profit regarding investors as well as their investment. The important distinction here is that the tokens were airdropped. No one purchased them before they were created. So making the claim that there were investors is definitely a little bit more difficult. But the critics are saying that because anyone can go to Uniswap to purchase tokens and on their exchange and that most people are purchasing them with an expectation of profit means that they're probably, in fact, investors expecting profits from those shares. Yeah, there's definitely a lot to dissect here, I think. But uh, first, of course, the common enterprise will come into question because I assume the counter argument is that Uniswap is a decentralized protocol and therefore there is no common enterprise solely developed off of the work of others. And by airdropping the tokens, I know back in the ICO days, the remedy was to do exactly that and not allow ICOs before tokens have an actual use. So the question will likely fall around the uni use case and how it was launched on day one. Could the airdrop be interpreted as a marketing tactic to build demand in order to create price increases? Or is it a method of decentralization? You know, is the power to change the protocol, in fact, now being completely in the hands of the community, decentralized enough to get it away from that common enterprise example? So definitely so many ways you could look at this. And I think this demonstrates exactly why the Howey test has plenty of gray areas when it comes to being, you know, sort of this supposedly perfect tool to evaluate whether something is a security or not. Absolutely. And luckily, when it comes to security tokens, as we as an industry already embrace needing to follow these regulations. So largely, the Howey test will become the new plague for DeFi tokens if the laws are not amended for fringe use cases. I think the strongest argument from Uniswap's perspective as for why it's not a security lies in the idea that the protocol has become fully decentralized. The SEC and other financial regulators have hinted at the idea of sufficient decentralization being a key indicator of whether an asset would be considered a security, and Uniswap makes a strong argument on that front. It has users around the world transacting in a fully decentralized manner. The founding team has fully removed itself from the development of the the newest updates in the protocol and are even removing themselves from the governance in the protocol moving forward, which you can track on Etherscan based off of if they've staked their tokens or not. If the SEC deems this a security, the question remains, who is in charge of upholding the requirements and punishments here? Uniswap is almost fully running autonomously at this point, which makes holding the founding team accountable for the actions of the community something that seems relatively antiquated for me. Unfortunately, you know, we are in an antiquated world. So I think I totally agree with all your points, but let's see how this all, you know, ultimately plays out for the uni token. And with that, hopefully our listeners got a good understanding of what the Howey test is and why it defines security specifically in the U.S. 
And I think with that, I think we can end the show here. So I want to thank you all for being awesome listeners. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Security Token Show. Yeah, and please, if you have any questions or feedback, please reach out to us on Twitter or LinkedIn or anywhere else you want to chat or join the rest of the community in voting, submitting, and commenting at stomarket.com slash news if you wanted to get more involved. We want to hear your thoughts on whether you think Uniswap's Unitoken is a security or if you think it isn't. And be sure to catch us again next Tuesday. And thanks again for listening. 